So I want to sing this chorus one more time, but I want you to think of amazing things that we're about to remember. For all my life you have been faithful. For all my life you have been so, so. goodness. 
go back into worship and just like we did before communion, just reflecting on uh, the power of the gospel and the power what, of what Jesus did for us. And just as we did as we took the bread and the cup, as we sing this next song, we want you to just reflect on that as well. God has been so good to us. And this song is about blessing as well. It's, it's a song that comes from scripture and just declares blessing over your life. So as we sing this song, just receive the blessing that Christ has given to you this morning. The bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And
possessions of your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations of your family and your children and their children and their children. Lord, we know that you're working on hearts, Lord Jesus. God, we know you're calling hearts. We know that you're challenging hearts, Lord Jesus, this morning. Oh, Lord, I pray that everyone in here realizes and knows, Lord God, that you are for them. You're not against them. You're for them, Lord Jesus, God. <laughs> the creator of the heavens and the universe is for you this morning. He is rooting for you. He is cheering for you this morning. Oh, Lord, let us realize in our heart, Lord Jesus, God. You just want a relationship with us. You just want to know us. You want us to know you, Lord. Well, let's find that this morning. Let's find that type of relationship with you, Lord God, to where you reveal yourself to us. You let us know that we are not alone. You let us know that we are not forgotten this morning. But you're right by our side, Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray that you have your way in our service this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. You know, it's okay just to wait his presence sometimes. We're not in a hurry this morning. Sometimes all you need to do is you don't have the words to say, you don't really know the song. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just stand and take a deep breath. <laughs> Some of you need to rest in his arms this morning. Some of you are carrying so much anxiety, so much fear. You just need to take a deep breath and release all that. Oh, and just rest at his feet this morning. Just rest in his presence this morning. Some of you are overwhelmed with life. Just take a deep breath this morning. Breathe in the Holy Spirit. Breathe in the Lord. Just rest in his presence. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, God, we praise your name. Oh, Lord, we worship you this morning. <laughs> oh, I'm so thankful for you this morning, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to ask you guys if you'll do me a favor this morning. 
Pastor Mike already mentioned that uh, Pastor Jonathan and Pastor Macy have a big day tomorrow. I thought, man, what a better way to send them off is if, would you join me in prayer this morning? Let's just pray over this marriage, pray over this couple. What I'd like for you to do is, as they come stand up here, I want you to just reach your hands forward towards them. And let's just pray a prayer of blessing over this marriage as it begins tomorrow. Would you join me in prayer? Hallelujah, Lord God. We just thank you for Pastor Jonathan, God. We thank you for Pastor Macy, Lord Jesus, God. God, we just pray a prayer, prayer, a prayer of blessing over this marriage, Lord God. As they, they start tomorrow as a relationship with you, Lord God. Lord, they, they just grow that in, in a love for each other, Lord Jesus, God. We pray that you're... Your, your face be upon them, Lord God. Your love this always shines in our heart, Lord Jesus, God. We know there will be, there'll be trials, Lord God. I know there will be frustrations, Lord Jesus, God. But your love will always be there, Lord God, to tie them to you, to tie them together, Lord Jesus, God. That no matter what they face, they face together in your love, Lord God. They face together united and anchored in you, oh Lord Jesus, God. We just pray a prayer, a blessing, Lord God. Every place they put their foot, Lord Lord God, you've already given them, Lord Jesus, God. You've called them, Lord God. You've anointed them and you sent them, Lord Jesus, God. And they're walking in your, in your will, Father, Lord Jesus, God. So I pray tomorrow, I pray that they just take a deep breath tomorrow and enjoy their day. Enjoy the start of this beautiful relationship, Lord Jesus, God. And may your favor ever be upon them, Lord. Your precious holy name we pray. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, it's funny. They, um, Pastor John and Pastor Macy's families are all here. A lot of them are here with us this morning. And as we're singing that song, I was thinking of Brother Hitchcock. You know, he prayed that prayer over his kids, their kids, their kids. And so you get to see that represented this morning. I'm telling you, I had said it last week, and I don't want to be a repeat, but man, something powerful when you pray, when you sing scriptures like we did this morning. That song, if you didn't realize, that comes from Nehemiah. And there's, there's power in the Word of God. And when you sing the Word of God, oh, baby, it just comes alive like it did this morning. And there's power behind it. And so I just, I, you, you can't say enough about that. But getting right into it. Uh, there's no question uh, where we're at in Romans, Romans chapter 10 this morning. We're going to end up Romans chapter 10 today, finish it up, the second half of chapter 10. We started it last week, and uh, the week, two weeks ago. Holy cow, I can't believe it was in two weeks. But uh, yeah, Andy spoke last week, did a great job on serving. And we have the table still set up out front. So if you have feeling God calling you to, to get involved... You know, I gave the illustration of, you know, a kid, when he was in a swimming pool, one of the fun things to do in a swimming pool was start making laps, right? And you finally get all, the, all everybody going the same direction. You, you're creating this whirl, whirlpool type of deal. And then you just stop and you just let go and it, it'll take you around, right? I mean, that was a blast. But to do that, everybody's got to be going in the same motion. And you always had that one knucklehead. All he wanted to do was float, Right? You're like, bro, you got to start walking sometime. You got to help out. You got to create your mon- m- momentum. And that's, that's what we're saying, you know. Time to start helping out. You know, we love that you come and float, but uh, help us walk a little bit this time. And so all the, all the, all the venues are out front. You can sign up to do anything you wanted. Uh, we had one gentleman sign up last week, and uh, he, just, he wanted to help around the church. So this past week he came and, and took care of our flower bed out front underneath the sign. What a blessing. And that's something simple. I mean, I can even do that. That's pretty simple, right? But you know the impact. You think, well, nobody even notices. I guarantee you somebody notices because my wife notices. Because every time we pull up to the church, she elbows me and says, man, why don't you take care of that? I said, I'll get to it. And if you're married, guys, you know that's code for, I pretty much will never do that. But um, I kept telling her I'd get to it. I'd get to it. I'd get to it. I never got to it. And luckily, we had a gentleman, he, he did. And what's cool about it, and you think, well, that's nothing big. What well, is big? Because if a visitor pulls up, they see that we're taking care of the church. That impresses them before even they even step in front and step inside of our church. And so that's a blessing to us. And, and he served a great way. And so we thank him for that. And so there's a lot of opportunities to sign up out front. 
Um, but this morning we're going to talk about another way to serve. And so we've been talking in Romans chapter 10. If you haven't read Romans chapter 10, I encourage you to go back and read Romans chapter 10. Because it's a great chapter about salvation. So maybe you've got that person in your life. Maybe you have that friend, coworker, uh, you're really feeling called to talk to, to witness to. Go here. Start here. Read this chapter. Learn this chapter. Uh, you know, it, it, walk through this chapter. It will help you in reaching out to that person. Because the first half of the chapter really talks about salvation, right? And then the second half really talks about maybe our responsibility to that, to the good news. What do we have? And we're talking about all last week and, and this week, is, we're talking about the simplicity of salvation. And I say simplicity of salvation because it's kind of like, it's like this light switch over here, right? If you go over there and flip that switch, it turns on the lights. Flip it, it turns off the lights. Very simple, right? But when we say it's simple, we know it's not actually that simple. And if you're an electrician, you know it's really not that simple. Because if you are even dabbled in electricity, um, we're remodeling parts of our home, and we've been, I've been attempting to do some electrical work, and uh, it's not easy, let me just tell you. It's not simple. So appreciate that switch when you turn it on, especially if there's a three-way switch involved, just don't even mess with it. You know, just say, you know what, honey, we can get up and walk to the end of the hallway and flip the switch. It'd be a lot simpler than me getting in the attic right now. But And so understand this. When I say simplicity of the gospel, I'm not making light of it because we know a lot goes into it. We know for electricity to get there, you have to run wires throughout this building. It goes to the electrical box in the corner over here that you can't get to. And for electricity to get in that, it comes from the, the power station. And from there, it dumps it down to where we can handle it. I mean, there's a lot, we know there's a lot that goes into it. And so we know that you know, God has put together his master plan of salvation to transform sinners into saints. And we've walked through the complexities of that. And so when I say simplicity of salvation, I'm not using that term lightly. I'm saying that when it comes to our response, he knows who he's talking to. He knows he's talking to a Brent Hurt that really wouldn't get much. And so he made it very simple how to respond to the gospel. And here's how we respond. Everyone who calls upon his name, right? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's not as simple as flipping a switch, but he made it that simple for you and I. So if we respond, everyone, not a certain race, not a certain nationality, not a certain individual, you have to have this. No, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's that simple. But we know there's a lot that goes into it. And so this morning, we're going to look at where we left off in verse 13. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the question comes up then, if it's that simple, Pastor, if it really is that simple, if we don't, aren't you glad we don't have to do a lot? Aren't you glad that we don't have to, like, you know, roll a boulder up a mountain to be forgiven of your sins? Or every time you mess up, you've got to go back to that same boulder and say, all right, here we go, buddy. You probably named it by now because you're so close friends with it. And you've got to roll it up the mountain every time you mess Aren't you glad we don't have to go through that? That's the simplicity of the gospel. But if it's that simple then, why hasn't more people responded to the message? You know, if it really is so simple, Pastor, it's that easy, why, why don't more people respond? Well, the answer is the same as it is to the light switch. If you want the light to turn on, you have to choose to walk over there. You have to choose to flip the switch. Right? So it's all up to you. The power's there. The lights are in the fixtures. You have to choose to walk over there and turn, turn it on. Our lives are filled with choices. Every day you make choices. You chose to what, to, you know, what to wear today. For some of that, for some of you, it took a lot longer than others. But you had to choose what to wear. What matched? What didn't match? Every day you're faced with choices, what to have for breakfast. Even when you get to work, more choices and choices and choices. We have choices every day. Some have little impacts on our day and our lives, and some have big impacts on our lives. The choice to respond to the gospel message is one of those choices that will impact the rest of your life. And even beyond the rest of your life, it impacts your eternity, the choice that you have to make. And look how Moses puts it in Deuteronomy 30, 15. I love this. Very simple. Very simple. Today I give you a choice. 
You can choose life and success or death and disaster. <laughs> well, man, when you put it like that, <laughs> you know, what are you going to choose? Life and success, death and disaster. Uh, I think I'll take number two, death and disaster. No, I mean, come on. But you still have a choice. It's your choice, and yet people are still making that choice every day to choose death and disaster. So in our study, as we've been walking through this, about walking through the book of Romans, we know that Paul is primarily speaking to the Jewish people. He's really been making the salvation case all the way from chapter 1 until now. He's making a salvation call for his kinsmen, for his brothers, right? And he's laid out the, all the information. He's been walking them through the process. But ultimately, it comes down to them. They have to choose. You have to choose. Your spouse cannot choose for you. Your mama can't choose for you. Your grandma, as much as she wants to, she can't choose for you. You have to make the choice. It's all in your hands. And Paul tells us it's one of the best choices you could ever make. In Romans chapter 10, verse 11, Scripture reassures us, no one who trusts God like this, heart and soul, will ever, will ever regret it. No one. The best choice you can ever make. You make this choice, Paul says you're not going to regret it. Best choice you can ever make. Verses 14 to 21 help us, helps us to understand why. And so again, the question kind of naturally arises, but if it's such a great, simple choice, why hasn't more people chosen this? Well, some people do. Some people choose it, but they don't commit to their choice. You ever, you ever notice that? Have you ever seen anybody do that? Maybe like uh, you're at the store, you're shopping. You know, you pick something up and go, okay, I choose this. All the way out the store, you're just, I mean, you're just, you know, you're looking for it. Just in case, just in case there's something else, there's something a little bit better. And that's what a lot of people do. They come to a great service like we had this morning. Worship was amazing. And they feel the little spiritual goosebumps and, and they get motivated, and there's a salvation call, and they choose Christ, which is great. But then they sort of don't commit to that choice. It's like, I choose this, but uh, all the other stuff that goes along with it, you know, I'm good. They say they choose Christ as their Savior, but their life doesn't reflect it. Here's a news flash: If you choose Christ, your life is not going to look like everybody else. If it does look like everybody else, I question your choice. You're not committed to your choices. We're not supposed to look like everybody else. We're different. We're not called to this world. So we're going to do things a little different. We're not going to allow certain things in our life. We're not going to allow certain things to enter our mind. We're not going to take part in certain conversations. We are going to look a little different. So how committed to the choice are you? I choose Christ, but I don't want to follow his commands. Well, that's not enough. You choose Christ, you have to commit. Commit to obeying the commands. So let's look at verse 13 there in chapter 10. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what Paul does, he, he uses this kind of as a launching pad to the rest of the chapter. Because he actually goes right into a list of rhetorical questions he asks. And let me read them to you. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? It's a, I mean, that's a good question, right? How do you call for help for someone you don't believe in? You know, I remember I, I, I told a story one time when, when before your we pastors, I was helped changing the lights. And there's light bulbs in the very back. You probably can't see them, but in the very back over the stairwells. Well, as a guy, you don't want to, you know, take time to do everything right sometimes, right? I mean, you're there, the light's there, we can change this. And so I'm sitting on the balcony rail up there, and I could reach the light bulb, right? And so I'm like, I see Brett Marmon's around. Pastor Johnson was still here. He's around. I really just need somebody to kind of hold my belt. While I, I just make sure I didn't fall off into the stairwell. And so I, I'm thinking, I'm looking at the situation. I could go get a ladder, but let's be honest. That, you know, I walk all the way over to the event center, all the way, and i got to put it up. That's just too much work. I'm like, what can I do here? Like, you know what? And so who am I going to choose, okay? Brett Marmon, let me just give you a little secret here. He gets paid to work out. He's a health coach, right? A fitness a PE coach. He, he, that's what he does every day. Like, literally, he gets paid to work out. Pastor Johnson, not so much. <laughs> and 
And so in that situation, who am I going to call on? I'm going to call on the one I know has the strength to hold me if I fall. Right? Who are you going to call on? How are you going to call on somebody you don't know? You know, you don't know if they, I'm not calling on somebody I don't know. Doesn't at least work out every once in a while. Because I'm a kind of a big guy. I don't want to fall. That's going to hurt. And so I call on somebody I know, and that's what Paul's simply stating here. How they didn't, well, they call on him who they not believe. They, they didn't believe in him. They didn't know him. How, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? How do they hear unless someone is sent? So who, so who is sent right here? Who is sent? Well, if you look to Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about some are given gifts, right? The gifts of uh, uh, preaching, gifts of teaching, gifts of the prophets, gifts of apostles, evangelists. These are the gifts, right? But I believe beyond that, that it's God's intent that every one, here where serve comes in, every one is a preacher. Everyone is a preacher of the good news. John 20, 21. Some of you are you're not liking this right now. All of you introverts are like, whoa, hang on a second. Hang on, I'm not. No, every one of us is called to be a preacher. John 20, 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You. You are called to preach the good news no matter what your profession is. You are sent. What about the Great Commission? Matthew chapter 28, 19 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. God is sending you. You are called. You are called to go spread the good news. You are called to preach. You are God to teach. You are called to go obey every command. All of us are sent. All of us are called to share the good news. Reality is going to take all of us to reach our community. If you look at our community, remember I mentioned this last week, we did a, a survey of 20 minutes within Brighton, 20 minutes away from Brighton, any direction you go, 20 minutes. We did a circle around that. And there's a, there's a formula, you can plug in all the numbers, and, and Barna Research Institute did it where you can estimate the number of unreached um, people in your area and within 20 minutes of Brighton any direction there's 11,578 people who are not reached that means maybe at one time they were serving the Lord but now they're not attending church they're not they're not, they're not serving the Lord now 11,578 that's going to take every one of us because I guarantee you there are people in your life that I will never meet there are people in your life that would not give two cents for my opinion but for some reason, they value your opinion. <laughs> and they will listen to you. And you have a voice in their life. You're called to preach. You're called to share the good news. You're called to be a preacher. But you didn't know that, did you? Every one of us is called to bring the good news. Look what Paul says about this in verse 15. As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Here, this is cool. I want you to understand what Paul is saying. He's actually referencing Isaiah chapter 52. In Isaiah 52, talking about when Israel will come back to the land of Israel. Israel's been in captivity. One day they'll come back to Israel, and there's going to be people, the messengers, going to go forth announcing, we're free, we're free, we're free. You don't know how big that is, but Israel being in captivity, living in captivity, is huge. They want to be free. They're God's chosen people. They're supposed to be free. They're supposed to be ruled. They're supposed to reign. And saying there's going to be a day, and that's coming. And Isaiah is saying the message is going to go forth and going to spread the news. Paul's wanting you to get this idea of celebration, uh, celebrating freedom from captivity. You need to understand that. And so Paul's point here is to share the good news. Those who are sharing the good news, those messengers, are beautiful. It's because of the message they're bringing. Because the message of freedom that they're bringing. Think about that. Come on. There's people in your life that needs that message of freedom. 
There's people in your life that are bound up. They don't know what to do. Their relationships are falling apart. Their life is falling apart. They are in captivity. They would love to hear about this freedom. They love to hear about this peace that they don't know about. But they're longing for that in their life. And you have that. You could be that beautiful messenger just shouting all everywhere you go. That's why you're called to be a preacher everywhere you go. Look what the Lord has done in my life. Look what God has done. Look how God has changed my life. Look what all that God has given me. That's the good news of the gospel. That's what you are called to do. Be a messenger to set the captive free. We're tasked with the responsibility to bring the good news that there's freedom. (laughs) Some of you this morning need to step into that freedom. Some of you this morning maybe have so much anxiety and fear right now. You need to learn to walk in that freedom. You're being held captive. So we are called to proclaim the good news. And it just keeps on getting better. Verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. Did you catch where faith comes from? It comes from hearing, but hearing what? Hearing through the word of Christ. Faith, which we have to have, it comes as you and I talk about the Word of God. <laughs> Are you kidding me? It's just, it's so easy. It's so easy. There's power in the Word of God. How many times have we said that? There's power in the Word of God. But how many times do we do self-talk? We do self-talk a lot. I, I mean, maybe you don't, but I, I know I do a lot of times. And as we're getting ready to bring this good news, maybe invite somebody to coffee, the coffee's gotten cold, the food's all gone, and you're trying to warm up the courage to share about the good news, and you start doing a little self-talk. Well, you know, they, they don't really want to listen right now. They're not in the mood. Uh, they won't receive this right now. They're not ready to change. Or, you know, or then it turns to you. What am I thinking? I can't do this. I need, to invite some, I need to invite a pastor along with me. They, they, can, they can hit them home. I can set them up and they can hit it home, right? And so we do all this negative talk. Well, you know, I, I barely understand it. You know, I can't quote no scripture. One scripture I can quote, the one apply here, because they don't care that Jesus wept. So, I mean, that's all I've got. <laughs> and so we start talking all this self-talk that we talk ourselves out of even sharing the good news of what God has done in our lives. And Satan loves that. He loves to get you to that point where you start thinking, well, I can't do this because it's perfect. Then you don't say nothing and he wins. And you see what you're doing there? You see when you start doing this negative talk, well, I can't do this or I don't know this or I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not that. What are you doing? You're, you're, you're making it all about you. It's all about your ability. But what does verse 17 tell us? It says, all we have to do is say the word of God so they can hear. That's it. That's all you got. It's a kiss method. Keep it simple, stupid. I mean, come on. You don't have to know the Romans robe with with the scripture references. You don't have to know the 16 fundamentals of the assembly of God with two scripture backs that back that up. You don't know it. All that is great stuff, and it would be great for you to know that. But what does it say? It literally says all you got to do is share the word with them. All you got to do is simply tell them, hey, this man called Jesus, he left heaven, came to earth, because we messed up. There's no way we can make it right. So he took our penalty. He died on the cross. Grave could not hold him. He rose from the grave, and now he's back in heaven. All for you so you can experience freedom. That's it. That's all you have to say. And lives can be changed. Souls can be transformed just in the power of his name. So what does the Bible say? Just the niching of his name. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. You don't have to give a theological breakdown about the doctrine of election. If you can do that, I'd love to talk with you. But you don't have to do that. All you have to do is mention the name of Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about what Jesus did for you. Tell them the change that's happened in your life since Jesus came. come. Tell them how much you love Jesus. Oh, you won't believe what Jesus did for me this weekend. You don't, well, you won't believe what I learned about Jesus this weekend. Just tell them about Jesus, what he's done for you. Because the great thing is then it's not about my ability. It's all about him. 
It's all about the power in his name. It's all about the power in his word. It's about me getting a simple message that God sent Jesus to the earth to take my judgment, to die on the cross, raise from the grave, so I can be free. It's really that simple. Just tell them about Jesus. Okay, pastor, if it's really that simple then, why haven't more people believed? Verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Again, every person has to make a choice. You have to decide, am I going to believe this is true? Or am I going to believe this is true? And am I going to commit my life to this truth? One hand, you believe. I'm here, ain't I, pastor? I'm in church. I believe. Okay. But maybe you haven't chose him. You're here out of obligation, obligation maybe. You're here because your wife made you come. You're here because your husband made you come. You're here just because so grandma can see me. And when she sees me, I won't get the phone call this week that, hey, where is you at? You're here. Maybe you're checking a, a spiritual time card saying, boom, I'm here. I'm good. So you're here, but you're not real fully committed. You're here, and there's no change in your life. I choose Christ. Okay, well, if you choose Christ, then that means he's in charge. And that's where the rub comes in for some people. If he is Lord, then you're going to follow him. If he is Lord, then you're going to do what he asks of you. That's the hard part. So we all make a choice. And even if you haven't made a choice in reality, you really have made a choice. So Paul is saying that not all obey the gospel. Well, then being a good Jew, you could say, well, not everybody, not everybody has heard the good news. And we get that argument today. Well, not everybody has heard the good news. Okay? Verse 18. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and the words to the ends of the earth. Paul, right here, he's quoting from Psalms 19. If you have not read Psalms 19, it's a beautiful chapter about how nature reflects God, how, how the natural reflects God. And let me read you the first four verses here. The heavens declared the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. This is all just the earth. He's talking about the heavens and, and the sky. This is all without saying a word. There is no speech, nor there are words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the earth. Paul is saying Israel should have known there is a God. What he's saying, he said, look back to uh, uh, Psalms 19, every one of them uh, good teachers, good students would have had this memorized so they know exactly where he's going. He said, okay, look at the sky. Go out tonight when you go home. It should be a clear night. If you live out in the country, go outside and look at all the stars. What a masterpiece when you look up at night and see all the stars working in unison to make this beautiful artwork. You, we drove up this morning, and if you don't know if you caught the sunrise or not, but man, the way the clouds were at and the sun, oh, is it beautiful? And he got even threw in a couple of little dancing calves out there when we were pulling up. I mean, that's a be- I mean, you can't smile at a dancing calf. You can't smile. <laughs> it was just beautiful pulling up to a church today. Paul's saying, you see all that. How can you say there's not a creator? You see this beautiful creation You know, this is testimony that there was a creator that created this. So you know, it didn't happen by accident. There was a creator. There was a design. You look at the sky at night, you know there was a design. Today you go outside, you attempt to look at the sun without scorching your eyeballs out. You know there was a design. You look at the, the science of it with one degree off. The way the axis of the, the sun is to the earth, one degree off, we're all crispy critters. One degree the other way, we're all frozen. There is a design. It means there's a design. It means you know that there's a God. 
this is how you know, without a word even being mentioned, you know there's a, the God, there's a God because you see this creation and there is a creator. Paul is saying Israel should have known. Nature itself speaks to this. But, he, but even more than that, Paul is using scripture to show them the gospel has gone out. Have they not heard? Of course they heard. Paul himself told them about this. Well, maybe they didn't understand. Okay, well then Paul takes them to Moses and to Deuteronomy. To you and I, it doesn't mean a lot when he mentions Moses and he references Isaiah. But what he's doing there, remember, Paul is a brilliant man. And this is so cool how he does this. So in one shot, he references basically the whole Old Testament. Moses which represents a lot of the Old Testament, and then Isaiah, which represents the prophets. And so he's basically saying, hey, okay, Moses and the prophets, here's your examples. And that's like a mic drop for the Jews. You can't argue with Moses and the prophets, so they know. Because they, they, what they represent, the law and the prophets. Did they not understand? Of course they did. In verse 19, but I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. What Paul is talking about is, is the nation of Israel rejected God. Yeah, sure, there's a few of the Jews that accepted, accepted Christ, accepted this new Messiah. But for the, for the whole, the nation of Israel rejected Christ. So what did God do? He turned to the Gentiles. The Jews would not accept his grace, his mercy, the goodness of God. So God said, you know what? I'm going to make this foolish nation. Because everybody, everybody, the Gentiles were the lowest of the low. He said, you know what, I'm going to make this nation my nation. I'm going to show them grace. I'm going to show them mercy. Jonathan Macy, could I get you guys to come back up? Riley. They didn't understand. Verse 20 says this, Then Isaiah is so bold to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. You and I should be shouting, should be shouting at this verse. I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have, made, I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. It's saying God revealed himself to people all the time. He revealed himself to you. He revealed himself to me. Saying God is revealing himself to people. The gospel message is simple. It's simple. All you have to do is believe. Yet there's still those who believe, but they don't want to obey. They don't want to hear. They, they still reject Christ. They well, I believe, I believe, but yet every day in their choices, they reject Christ. And so it ends in verse 21. This is a powerful verse. I want you to see this picture that Paul paints in verse 21. But of Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Do you see what it's saying here? The Creator, God, is holding out His hand. God's standing here like this. Day after day, He's standing here like this. Day after day, a couple things there. He's showing incredible patience towards Israel. Day after day, even in their disobedience, he's still like, come on, come on back. Come on, come to me. Day after day, they're still not choosing him. It's showing that he's still there. Day after day, and even in their disobedience, he's standing there. He's saying they know what to do, yet they're doing the exact opposite. You know, you and I would not show this kind of grace, would we? You know, if somebody wrongs you, okay, we can forgive them. Somebody wrongs you again, you forgive them, but you don't like it, right? Like, okay, I'm just doing this because the Bible says I have to. Somebody wrongs you a third time, it's like that's where grace stops. Like, okay, I'm done. You're cutting them off, right? You're, you're done. But look at the love of God. All day long, I've held up my hands. All day long. The Creator is holding His hands out to the creation. Come on back. The Creator who does not need the creation. He can make another creation. You're getting a picture of His grace this morning, His mercy. The Creator holding out His hands. 
even in our disobedience, he's still standing there. No matter what you've done, no matter how disobedient you've been, no matter how hateful you've been, his arms are open. Not only that, he is consistently working in life to demonstrate his grace and his mercy. Why don't you stand with us this morning? Think about this. If you're in here and have not responded to the good news, you're not here by accident. It did just happen that we're going to be speaking in the second half of Romans today. It didn't just happen that you woke up and you came here. It wasn't just happenstance. Me to go down a rabbit trail, get real crazy on you. It wasn't just happenstance that Jonathan and Mace are getting married tomorrow, that all the family would be here to hear this message. I'm not saying they need it. I'm just saying that's how God works. And God's got a calling on their life. There's a lot more things. But you never know how God is going to use circumstances in life. And what that speaks to is even in the disobedience, He's standing there with arms open. He's saying, hey, hey, come on, choose me. Choose me. He brought you here today. God is at work. He's chasing after you. really as simple as turning on that light switch but the bottom line is he's done all this amazing things remember we talked about all he's done for you how God put this master plan in place before the beginning of time he focused his love on you he had this plan that he sent his son to earth that there's no way we could get to God but because Jesus died on the cross we get to be clothed in his righteousness what a gift if you accept that gift of justification, your life has totally changed, and you realize that, you say, I want to serve you, Lord. Well, he knew we couldn't even get that right, so he said, you know what? I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. So now you have power, and now you can serve me. With power, you can serve me. With power, you can share the Word of God. With power, you can love those who are unlovable. I'll even give that to you. All that. He's given to you. All that he's laid out. All you have to do is choose him. This morning, would you choose him this morning? He's standing, arms wide open. Hey, would you please just come? The God of the universe wants a relationship with you. I ask myself why every day. Why, God? Why me? I will never be able to answer that question. So I just stand with a big smile on my face because I got chosen. (laughs) You got chosen. Have you chosen him yet? Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray this morning. Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray this morning. If there's anyone in here that has not chosen you, that this would be the morning they flip the switch. That this would be the morning they flip that light switch and they would choose you, Lord God. Not only would they choose you, but they devote to walk in that truth, Lord God. They would devote themselves to live in that truth, Lord Jesus, God. Oh, God, that they would choose you and to serve you and to serve what you say, to obey your commands, Lord God. That they would choose you. Oh, God. I pray this morning that you're working on hearts. Right now, you're working on hearts, Lord Jesus, God that every person would examine their heart this morning and ask themselves, why am I here? Am I here out of obligation or I'm here because I want a relationship with the Creator? Oh, God. Oh, God, would you move this morning? Oh, Lord. I want to ask you this this morning there's anyone in here that would like to choose him this morning would you take a bold step this morning and choose him all you gotta do 
is just say a simple prayer. I'll even lead you in that prayer this morning. I'll do you even one better. We will all join with you in saying this prayer this morning. But the simple reality of fact is it won't matter unless it means something to you. Unless you choose this morning. So right now, right now, ask yourself, am I ready to make this choice? Am I ready to vote my life to Him? Am I ready to make a change? Why don't you do a little self-talk right now with, and figure that out? Because we're going to lead you in this prayer. And we're all going to pray it. It won't matter unless it matters to you. So I want to ask this morning, would every one of you join me in prayer this morning? Would you just say this prayer with me? Dear Father, I call upon your name today. I'm confessing my sins before you. I'm believing in my heart that you are the Lord of all. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins and choosing me. It's that simple. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord, for forgiving us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for choosing us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for focusing your love upon us this morning, Lord God. Oh, God, give us the faith to walk in that this morning. Give us the faith to walk in that freedom this morning. Give us the faith to believe in what we just said this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, the second part of this is this morning. I got a second challenge for you. As I believe that the Lord is laying on some of your hearts, those in your, in your life. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. There's someone in your life that does not know Jesus. He's calling you to that person this morning. He's calling you to reach out to that person. He's calling you to love that person. He's calling you to share the good news of that person this morning. So right now, I, I, I know every one of you has somebody in your mind. Every one of you know of somebody. So right now, I want to ask you, as Jonathan and Macy lead us in this song, I want you to pray for that person. I want you to pray that God will give you opportunity this week to minister to them. I want you to pray that God will give you opportunity, God will give you boldness this morning, just to share the love with them this week. This to share life with them. This to share the gospel message with them. Pray that God will give you opportunity this week that you'd walk in that opportunity. Would you join us in worship this morning?
goodness of God. Sing that again. Your goodness is running. Your goodness is running out. It's running out. It's running out. 